Let's turn together in God's Word to Revelation 6, Revelation 6, and we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 17 today, Revelation 6, verses 12 through 17, and you'll find that in your pew Bible on page 1031. Revelation 6, verses 12 through 17, where God's Word reads as follows. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place." Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? So far the reading from God's word this morning. May he add its blessing to our hearts. Well, there's several times, uh, just a brief survey of my own life, where I can remember uh, disobeying my parents in a public place. Uh, maybe we were at a church event or something like that, and, and I got sideways with the law. And there was the look, right? There was the look. They didn't have to say anything. There was the look. They caught my eyes and... I knew when we got home, this was trouble. I was going to have to deal with this sin. Now, after that look, most of the time, I was able to get past whatever the hiccup was. I was able to forget that when I got home, I would be in trouble. I simply was able to get on with my day until I got into the car. You kids, you remember this probably much better than I do, but you remember getting into the car and you're, you're beginning the journey home. And you remember, oh yeah, oh yeah, when we get home, it's not going to be good. And it, I wasn't wrong. When we got home, it wasn't good. I would be sent to my room and, and you're waiting there, you're waiting for your parents to come and, and to administer discipline to you. And I remember that time of reckoning, your, your, your blood pressure would be rising and rising. And really, if I had my choice at that time, if I was maybe independently wealthy, I would prefer to hide eternally from, from the consequence that was mine, that, that I deserved, because who likes to deal with consequences? The, the fear of punishment was consuming at times, and, and the, the fear of punishment can be consuming uh, for all. We know that to be true because of the fear of punishment that we read about here in, in Revelation 6. Revelation 6 is a, uh, is a book that announces many forms of punishment, but in the sixth seal especially, a very heavy and grave eternal punishment. It's speaking to us about the day of the Lord. And as we work our way through the sixth seal in verses uh, 12 through 17, we see that the day of the Lord is a dreadful day, a day when man will be judged for his sin unless he is forgiven by Christ, the day of the Lord. To, to learn that lesson, we want to look first at the ominous event that is described in our verses, and especially in verses 12 through 14, and then we want to see a predictable response from verses 15 through to the end of the chapter. So the day of the Lord is a dreadful day when man will be judged for his sin unless he is forgiven by Christ. To learn that lesson, we want to first see this ominous event that's described for us, and then we want to see a predictable uh, response. So let's begin by looking at this ominous uh, event. In verse 12, when the sixth seal is opened, there are six kind of cataclysmic, uh, what we would consider to be natural disasters, although it's not really fair to call them natural disasters because they are events that have never been experienced in all of human history for the most part. Uh, six great cataclysmic events that is judging them. And you see that again, Ezekiel 38, now in verse 16. You will come, God is talking to God, you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud covering the land. 
In the latter days I will bring you against my land that the nations may know me, when through you, O Gog, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. So in that case, uh, God is vindicating his own holiness through his judgment on Israel for their sin. In a sense, this judgment is a, vindic- is a, is a vindication of God's honor by, by judging all the sin that he encounters. Well, a, a true believing church is asking for that for a vindication for, from sin, for a judgment against their sin. And it's interesting, uh, in Revelation chapter 20, we have an explanation of Gog and Magog bringing it even into the book of Revelation because there, uh, the prophet John also uses this name, Gog and Magog. Satan is defeated and the final judgment is about to start. And Satan is released from his prison. And what does it say in verse 8? He comes out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Gog and Magog, also in the book of Revelation, are the enemies of God marching against the saints, and they are to be judged. The earthquake is the Old Testament sign that this great judgment is coming, that this great judgment is beginning. Then in, in chapter 6 and verse 12 and 13, we see uh, those, uh, those cataclysmic events that deal with the, the heavenly lights, right? The sun and the moon and the stars. Those are the second and the third and the, and the fourth symbols that, that uh, begin in verse 12 and, and end in verse 13. These symbols are also associated with judgment, but we have another piece of the puzzle. In this case, when we speak of these symbols, these are often associated with something that is called the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord is described in many places. One of the places that associates the sun turning to darkness and the moon to blood is found in Joel. And the prophet Joel, in chapter 2, And verse 30, it says, I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Now strip out the adjectives, right? Strip out the great and awesome. What are you left with? You have the, the sun becoming dark, the moon turning to blood before the day of the Lord comes. Further clarity on the day of the Lord is given in other prophets. There's this day of the Lord, which is associated with these signs that we're seeing here in the book of Revelation. And you turn to Isaiah 13 and verse 6 and There, the the prophet is prophesying against Babylon, Israel's great enemy. And he says to them, Wail, for the day of the Lord is near, as as destruction from the Almighty will come. Babylon, this mighty enemy of Israel, they are faced with imminent destruction. It's called the day of the Lord. It is God's day of judging his enemies. You can look in Jeremiah. 46 and verse 10 speaking of the day of the lord it says that day is the day of the lord god of hosts a day of vengeance to avenge himself on his foes the day of the lord this day of judgment this day of the outpouring of god's wrath 16 times in the prophets of the old testament talks about the day of the lord and the day of the lord is always a day of reckoning a day of payment Uh, for sin, a day of judgment from God against his enemies. But you also have this discussion about the day of the Lord in the New Testament. In one sense, you can say the day of the Lord has a fulfillment in the Old Testament, but there's also a continuation of it in the New Testament. The day of the Lord of the Old Testament, oftentimes viewed with the exile or the judgment of those nations that God used in the exile, where God... Uh, in, in a culmination of judgment, poured out his wrath on Israel, sent them out of the promised land by the hand of these pagan nations. But there's also discussion of the day of the Lord in the New Testament. 
For example, in 2 Peter 3, verse 10, the Apostle Peter says, The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. There's the heavenly lights again, right? They're going to be burned up. They're going to be dissolved. The day of the Lord is coming. It's not yet. It's, it's coming. It will come. And all the works of the earth will be exposed. There is always, de- in the day of the Lord, is always a dealing with the surprise of the return of Christ and its associated judgment. In the New Testament, when it speaks of the day of the Lord, it's speaking of Christ's final return. Then in Revelation 6, verse 14, so we've dealt with the first and the sixth event. We've dealt with the second, third, and fourth event. We only have to deal with the fifth event that is in our text, and that is that the sky uh, disappears. Uh, It says in verse 14 that the sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up. Well, we don't have an Old Testament equivalent for that, uh, for that symbol, for that event. But we don't need to look outside of the book of Revelation to understand what's being signified there. We can look within the book of Revelation to understand what part of redemptive history is in view when it comes to the sky vanishing. And you have to flip to Revelation 20 and verse 11. This is the judgment before the white throne. This is the second, this is the final judgment, the second coming of Christ. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. The the dissipation of the sky associated with the judgment, the second coming, the judgment when Christ is on earth. Uh, the white throne. You can also look in Revelation 21 and verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The heavens, uh, the sky, all of that gone, replaced new heavens and a new earth. The symbols, all of them are unique in a sense. They're all dealing with a different cataclysmic natural disaster, but all of them are pointing at the same thing. All of them are pointing at the second coming of Christ. And so when we're placing ourselves with the opening of the sixth seal, we're trying to understand what part of redemptive history are we dealing with. We're dealing with that aspect, that second coming of Christ when his judgment will be poured out uh, on on the world, uh, on his enemies. Now, when it comes to the first five seals, we saw that there was a literal soon and there was a prophetic soon. There was a a literal soon that, that dealt with suffering in the immediate. So AD 70, usually that's where we landed. And then we saw a prophetic soon as well. The literal soon, uh, God's judgment in the immediate, the prophetic soon, God's coming soon, or coming quickly to fulfill his judgment, his vindication of his saints. So we have to be careful. Not everything that we see in the world today is an outworking of God's judgment on the world. He has many reasons for why he allows certain things to take place. But the calamities in this world are always the result of sin. And we know that because if there were no sin, there would be no uh, tribulation. There would be no suffering. There would be no death. So we know that there's some sense of God reckoning with sin in the first five seals. But the sixth seal is a little bit different. The sixth seal, even though you might make a case for something that happened in the immediate in AD 70, uh, this is dealing with the second coming specifically. Uh, the, the, The final judgment is specifically what's in view. It's that one ominous event that God has planned in redemptive history. This is not a, a detour for God, right? If, if we're reading the Scriptures as the covenant of grace, there is always an understanding of this day of reckoning, this day of reckoning that will come. And, and, and so that's what's taking place here in the heavenly places when the seal is opened. Now, I don't want to get too far down this rabbit hole because I think it can distract us from, from what we're really supposed to learn, but... We saw this connection last Lord's Day between Matthew 24, what's called the Olivet Discourses, and Revelation 6. Uh, 
And in Matthew 24, verse 29, it talks about immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. And, and so then people have used that and understood that to have the whole significance point to this event in AD 70 when the temple uh, was destroyed. But if you're in Matthew 24 and you're looking at the full context of that passage in verse 31, when this event takes place, it says, He will send out His angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather His elect from the, whole, from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. There is a sense of totality, the gathering of the elect out of the whole world, not just a, a, a final cataclysmic event in one place in Jerusalem. Beyond that, in Matthew 25, in verse 32, you can see that he is talking here about the judgment of the world. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, it says there, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations. And he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So this text, Matthew 24, 25, Revelation 6, it's not just dealing with one nation. That would be dealing with ethnic Israel. It's dealing with the nations of the world. This is dealing with the final judgment. So even though Revelation is dealing with things that must soon take place, that's what it says in Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. From Revelation 22, verse 6, we know that includes the second coming of Christ. We know that the second coming of Christ is included in the words that must soon take place. And, and so we have here a picture of the prophetic soon, an urgent announcement of Christ's or God's next steps, even though he may make us wait 2,000 years, is still soon in the prophet's eyes it's the day of the lord it's not 80 70 i don't believe in the sixth seal but it's an outpouring of god's wrath in the final event of his judgment when the cry of the saints will be answered when the vindication of the saints will be complete AD 70 is not the same thing as the day of the lord it, it anticipates it maybe but it's not the same thing when you see the prophets speaking of the day of the Lord, and many of them do, uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Zephaniah, Malachi, they all speak of the day of the Lord. They're speaking of the final judgment. Well, they're speaking of the judgment of God's enemies, the enemies of Israel, and even uh, of the judgment of Israel itself. There is a day of reckoning, a day that's called exile, uh, in the Old Testament, but a day that's called the judgment before the great white throne in the New Testament. The day of the Lord, which Second Thessalonians 2 talks about. It speaks of the day of the Lord as the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in verse 1. And that we should not be quickly swayed that the day of the Lord has come. It only happens when Christ returns. That's the sixth seal. That's why in, in verse 17 it says, The great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? No one can stand before the Lord in the day of the Lord. So there's an ominous event, but then there's also a, a predictable uh, response that we see. There's a, a universal response to the coming of God's judgment. The, the text starts with the powerful ones, and, and it says in verse 15, the kings of the earth, the great ones, the generals, the rich, the powerful, uh, they're all affected by this coming day of the Lord. But then there's also uh, everybody else in, in, in uh, everyone, it says, and everyone, slave and free, from the most powerful man to the, the, to the lowliest of men, the day of the Lord affects them all, all People from all different classes, they all have the same reaction. What's the reaction in, in our text? Verse 15, they, they hide themselves in caves. They hide themselves among the rocks of, of the mountains. They're like children. Children who are afraid of the monster in the closet. And they hide under their blankets in their beds. 
Their response is the response of the sinner who knows his guilt. The response of the world is the response of the one who knows he's going to be judged. And they cry. They ask that they they would be hidden from the face of him. They, They prefer annihilation the mountains falling on them in verse 16 as if annihilation were possible okay so it's short-sighted maybe but but they want to be annihilated before they face god in the day of the lord they don't want to see his face they don't want to be in his presence have you seen that response before when somebody heard that god was coming and they didn't want to be around him That's what's described in Genesis 3, right after the fall, when Adam and Eve rebel against the Lord and they hear him walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and and what do they do? They hide themselves from God, or they, they try to hide themselves from the Lord. It is the fear of the condemned. Sometimes theologians will talk about that as a slavish fear, the fear of the one who's going to be judged unmercifully. That's the kind of fear that you see here in Revelation 6. The fear of those whose punishment cannot be avoided, and yet they remain obstinate in their heart. It is the fear that the demons have. In James chapter 2, when they know and believe that the Lord is one, and yet they quake with fear because they will not yield to Him, and they will not worship Him. They know who He is, and they know that His judgment comes, but they will not humble themselves before Him. There is a knowledge of what is coming in the day of the Lord, but there is an unwillingness to repent. Listen to the description uh, in Zephaniah 1, uh, where it describes the day of the Lord, and see if it matches up with Revelation 6. The great day of the Lord is near, Near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day. A day of distress and anguish. A day of ruin and devastation. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities. And against the lofty battlements. The day of the Lord is a dreadful day. It is the knowledge that in in eternity you will endure the furthest thing from the blessing of God. At the end of our morning service, we usually conclude the service with a pronouncement of the high priest's benediction from from number 6, verse 23 and following. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. That's the opposite of what the people of the earth want when the day of the Lord comes. They want to be hidden from the face of the Lord. In this world, we have faint reflections of God's attributes in sinful man. But when the day of the Lord comes, all those manifestations of God's common grace will be removed. Today in the world, even in fallen man, you see some semblance of the goodness of God. And there will be no hint of that in hell at all. There is some sense of God's kindness which is imprinted on the human soul, but in hell that will be all gone. There is some sense of the patience of God as we deal with each other imperfectly in this world, but the patience of God will be completely expired in hell and that is why the question at the end is so appropriate in verse 17 when they're faced with the horror and the terror of the day of the lord they say who can stand well it's it's a rhetorical question no one can stand no one can stand before the judgment seat of god it is a day of wrath for those who refuse the grace of God in Christ. And in the response of terror, there's a a stubbornness of a rebellious heart who refuses to take hold of the remedy that has been offered. 
as predictable as the fear of the enemies of the Lord may be, the scriptures prove there is not a need for it. It is man is in his obstinance holding fast to his rebellion, but he need not do it. There, there is a remedy to this slavish fears that, that so consumes unregenerate man that they want the rocks of the mountains to fall on them, to crush them so that they don't have to face the face of God. It is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In our confession, in the 20th chapter, it talks about Christian liberty. Well, slavish fear is like this oppressive reality. It's like me waiting in my room after I've disobeyed my parents. It's, it's a fear knowing that I'm going to be disciplined for my sin, and, and it's magnified infin, infinite, uh, what's the word? infinite number of times in, in waiting for the infinite judgment of God. But there's liberty. There's Christian liberty. And, and it doesn't mean liberty to, to do what I want. It means that Christ purchases freedom for the Christian. Freedom from the burden of guilt. Freedom of condemnation by the righteous standard of God's law. It changes Christ's purchase. It changes your heart from being filled with slavish fear having childlike love that's the liberty that Christ purchases for you to change you from one who asks for rocks to fall on you because the day of the Lord is coming to one who is under the altar and who cries out to to the father how long O Lord the one who is safe in the hands of God or the one who is in complete terror of the hand of God. Christ's blood purchases that freedom. It's announced throughout the scriptures that he is coming, that he has come. We know it. It's it's in all the pages of of God's word. His his humiliation culminating in his death on the cross is is the work of a of a substitute. The the wrath that the kings of the earth and all the slaves fear in Revelation 6, that's, that wrath is all removed in Christ. That's where the freedom is purchased. It's, it's no longer waiting for a judge to enter the room when you hear God's presence. It's, it's to know that your father has walked into the room. It is a change. It is no longer a slavish terror, but a, a comfort that comes through Christ. In the gospel, Christ assumes God's wrath. God's wrath is satisfied in him. It's a, it's a word that we don't use a lot in our conversation, but it's an important word in the Bible, this word propitiation. 1 John 4 verse 10 says, In this, uh, in this is love, not, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Everything that the people in Revelation 6 fear about God has been taken care of in Christ. That's the good news of the gospel. That's the good news that the church has been given the privilege of declaring. The, the, the church declares the day of the Lord is coming, so turn from your sin while there is time. It is also what the church says within the walls of the church when, when believers go astray. It's, it's the purpose of, of church discipline even. In 1 Corinthians 5, this, the Corinthian church is a, is a burnout church. I mean, this church is a mess, right? And they have this one man who is who's married to his mother-in-law and, and, and the church is approving of it and they think it's all good stuff. They're manifesting their grace and Paul urges them to cast this man out of the church. Why? You are to deliver this man to Satan, says the Apostle Paul, for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. That is the function of the discipline within the walls of the church even. 
that a man can be spared from the judgment of God that comes in the day of the Lord. In the 23rd verse of the book of Jude, it says that the church is charged with snatching some out of the fire. And, and, when, and when there is no snatching out of the fire, we only have, according to Jude 7, the example of Sodom in the judgment of God, where fire rained down from heaven and destroyed that place. Who can stand in the day of the Lord? Nobody can stand in the day of the Lord, but one. Christ stands in the day of the Lord. He assumes all of the wrath of God for His people. He, he is laid in the grave, but then He stands again. The Lord Jesus Christ, He stands. He is the source of the vindication of God's people. So what does that teach us? Well, first of all, we should consider the weightiness of refusing the gospel. For those of us who have spent much time in the church, we may become, we're more tempted maybe, to become numb to the gospel. We've heard it so many times, right? Turn to Jesus and your sins will be forgiven. Is that still the source of enthusiasm for you? Do you still get excited about that truth? Why, why should you care that Jesus has forgiven your sins? Why does it matter? Well, it matters because if you do not, God's glory will be established in your life through His judgment. That's why the gospel is good news today. Try as you might in vain to find a place where you would hide, where you would flee from Him. The judgment of God would come unless you're covered by Christ and His blood. To, re to refuse the gospel is to embrace willfully eternal terror and fear. Now, people will say the Christian life isn't about avoiding terror and fear. It's about giving glory to God. And I agree with that. that that's true. But the scriptures definitely do warn us that these things are coming and that we give glory because he saves us from these things. And so it is right for us to, to think about the great danger of being outside of the protection of Christ. The Bible shows us the urgency of turning from sin uh, through negative examples, through, through what happens in terms of punishment. It shows us that sin is weighty with eternal consequences, and we as Christians would be wise not to lose sight of that. So consider the weightiness of refusing the gospel. And in the second place, once you do that, the unavoidable consequence is that you will be able to consider the greatness of the gift of salvation. Are you struggling with gratitude to the Lord today? I think He's not giving us a fair shake in terms of what's going on in our nation maybe or or some other things that are going on in your life, well, if that's how you're feeling, you can meditate on, on this text. Because when you meditate on this text, the song that should overflow out of your heart is something like one of the lines from How Great Thou Art, right? And when I think that God, His Son not sparing, sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in. It is breathtaking that Christ did not cower before the prospect of the curse of God. His wrath. When we ask who can stand, there's only one answer. Christ can stand. And He did stand. And now He is seated at the right hand of the Father. You may stand before the God you've offended with your sin without any of the fear of the kings and the generals and the slaves of Revelation 6 because Christ stands to intercede for you. That is the glory of the gospel. That is your comfort in life and in death. That turns your fear into childlike gratitude. The day of the Lord as it's described in Revelation 6 is a dreadful day. The earthquakes and the, and the cataclysmic natural calamities of the sixth seal, they are, they are 
common prophetic announcements of the judgment of God. And, and yet from that portrait of terror is drawn the reminder of the gospel. It is in turning to Christ that the soul is saved from the punishment of eternal fire. That promise is offered to all. That promise is offered to you. You need not fear. You can trust in God through Christ our Lord. And when you do that, you enjoy the freedom that he has purchased for you, this freedom at the cost of his own blood. Let's pray together.